Hey there, people. This is Paul Street. This is the Paul Street Report. It is 3.07 p.m. Friday, September 20th. This is part four of my video series on revolutionary Marxism and communism. And um, here I initially wanted to dig into a slew of stupid shit that the left says and does. Um, things that are very non and even anti-revolutionary. I use the phrase left with quote marks. Did I make scare quotes around it? I should have a lot because I'm not sure that we have any real uh, entity or collection of entities anymore that deserve the recognition of uh, the designation, excuse me, as left. I'm looking at myself in the um, video here. Um, I have a knee thing. So I can't run anymore. My only, uh, my only um, aerobic exercise anymore is swimming. I see that chlorine has really got my head, my hair matted down on my head. Um, my apologies. It's, uh, it's my knee's fault. Uh, but before getting into that topic I was going to talk about, I realized today that I wanted to uh, first get three things out of the way, things that are very much part of this discussion of what's wrong with uh, left rhetoric, what's non and anti-revolutionary in the left, um, but that are, I think, big enough matters to deserve a separate talk today. We'll see how much of that I get through. The first thing I want to tackle is the claim that radicals are just whiners. You know, this is very Stanford. You're just against against. You're not for anything. You're antis but you're not fours. Um, and as part of that, I want to talk about the difference between a declared anarchist like Noam Chomsky and a revolutionary communist like Bob Avake. And the second thing I want to dig into and critique is the common um, left narrative that the purpose of the movement uh, for socialism is the advance of democracy. Uh, and the third thing I want to get into and critique in a very similar vein is the common left narrative that the purpose of the movement for socialism is the advance of equality. Uh, so let's get started. The left is often accused of just being against stuff and not for anything. Noam Chomsky, uh, years ago in a book that I think was called Failed State, somewhere in that book he had a very kind of clever and pithy response to that. He says, this claim has a useful translation. You have alternatives and we don't like them. And I was I always thought that was pretty cool. Um, but there are a couple of problems with Chomsky's response. And the first one is that Noam Chomsky's brilliant books and lectures um, were about 99% description and analysis of crimes and problems under uh, the capitalist imperialist system, with a particular emphasis in Chomsky on, on empire and imperialism. About 90%, about 99% about that, and about 1%, if that much, about uh, solutions. I think I emailed Chomsky once and said, how about giving 10 or 15 minutes of every one of these great big lectures you do, sometimes with thousands of people in the audience, how about giving the last 10, 15 minutes to the topic of what is to be done? You know, Lenin's topic, right? That's, you know, anarchists get scared even hearing the name of that pamphlet by big evil statist Lenin. Oh, <laughs> this did not influence Chomsky at all. It didn't change anything. Um, some of you may know that the avowed anarchist Chomsky used to say uh, that it would be authoritarian for him to, or any other intellectual and or activist to deign to have the chutzpah to try and tell people what is to be done. Uh, he, and Ch Chomsky also said um, that it was bad for intellectuals and activists to be charismatic. He thought it was better for them to be boring and really kind of nerdy because that would help people um, be leaders in their own right and discover truth in their own right, on their own, you know, in a non-culty kind of way, even though there really was kind of, I've seen it, I saw it in numerous times, a cult built up around Chomsky. Um, don't be charismatic and don't tell people what to do. Both admonitions. Don't proclaim your ideas on, on a societal alternative uh, and, and, um, and be, be kind of nerdy about it all. Um, which I can do and probably do in these videos a fair amount, the nerd thing that is. Both of those were part of what he considered to be um, a position of radical anarchist democracy, democracy. Uh, and both admonitions, in my opinion, were just complete bullshit. Masses need and want real alternatives, uh, real visions and plans for another way to live than under the class rule of capitalism and imperialism. They want that. They need that. 
And they want compelling and inspiring leaders. There's something wrong with this, to stand up and play a vanguard role in explaining what the alternatives are, what they could be, and why and how those alternatives can and should be achieved. And, you know, the second and related problem with Chomsky's we have alternatives and you don't like them response to the anti-charge, that you're all just antis and not for anything. Second problem with his pithy comeback to that is that uh, despite his self-designation as an uh, anarchist, I don't know, just philosophically, maybe not practically, but his self-description as an anarchist, uh, Noam's alternatives uh, for the United States pretty much always reduced to the standard liberal and progressive, at leftmost Bernie Sanders reform agenda to try and make life a bit more uh, tolerable and decent under American capitalism, imperialism, so, you know, green jobs, enhanced union organizing rights, a wider social safety net, higher taxes on the rich, single-payer health insurance, expanded voting rights, you know, and then all that sort of at the radical leftmost in Chomsky, a, a significant redistribution of resources from the Pentagon system to the meeting of social needs, you know, in always with so much of the left, the social needs uh, concentrated in the United States itself instead of, uh, um, instead of the rest of the world where people are vastly poorer than, than, than people are in America, thanks in no small part to the uh, American empire. And all this kind of interspersed with the standard time word references to workers, 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 working class, working class, working class, workers control, any anarchist is gonna bring up workers control and, 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 and the working class. To which some might say, wait a minute, Street, didn't Chomsky claim to be a left anarchist and don't left, left anarchists want to overthrow capitalism? Well, real hardcore left anarchists. I know some of them do. Uh, yeah, Chomsky did say he's an anarchist and, and anarchism and left anarchism is supposed to be anti-capitalist. But anarchism isn't really about overthrowing capitalism because doing that, overthrowing capitalism, would mean forming a tough, disciplined, oh, and horribly authoritarian, yes, to some degree, to a significant degree, vanguard party to lead a struggle to seize and use state power, the enemy of anarchists, state power, state authority, for the creation of a whole new way of living beyond the exterminist, alienating, and disease-inducing class rule of capital. And in fact, revolution in the U.S. and in other rich states is something that Chomsky don't get me wrong. I love the, the, the volumes of incredible work that Chomsky has done, in, uh, particularly with regard to foreign policy, which is really a U.S. imperialist. Uh, but revolution in the U.S. and other rich nations is something Chomsky never embraced. And this goes back a long way. I'm in possession somewhere in a box of a book full of Chomsky essays and lectures on education. It contains a 1969 lecture where Chomsky says, that revolutions are pretty much not a thing. I mean, when you read between the lines, that's what he's saying, that revolutions are not really a thing in advanced industrial states because the masses have too much to lose in the event of societal collapse um, under capitalism in an advanced industrial rich core state like the United States or England or France or Germany. Uh, and the argument was pretty much that revolutions and desirable revolutions, really. Uh, um, the desirable revolutions can really only happen um, in poor and peripheral nations in um, what was then called the third world, because there the great mass of people have nothing really to lose from a revolutionary uh, upheaval, which involves all kinds of dislocation. Well, you know, here we are 55 years later after that 1969 lecture. And I'd say the masses of the United States have quite a bit to lose along with the rest of the world from planet-wide ecocide generated by capitalism and from the related new problem, maybe I shouldn't say new, of pandemicide and from the drift towards global war between nuclear states, China, US, and Russia all brought to us courtesy of 500 years of capitalism and imperialism, which sounds like a lot, but which is really actually a small slice of total human history. To get a sense of how uh, 
limited Chomsky's vision was. Uh, I want to read a quote from a mostly brilliant 2004 essay in which Chomsky criticized eloquently the narrow spectrum of acceptable debate permitted in the United States uh, quadrennial, corporate crafted, candidate centered presidential electora, electoral extravaganzas, as he put it. This was in 2004, October 2004. The urgency, Chomsky said in that essay, is for popular progressive groups to grow and become strong enough so that the centers of power can't ignore them. In the election, Chomsky said, sensible choices have to be made, but they are secondary to serious political action. The main task is to create a genuinely responsive democratic culture. And this effort goes on before and after electoral extravaganzas, whatever their outcome. Now, Forget for a second, if you can, that the uh, essay that he did in 2004 uh, recommended voting for the abject imperialist John F. Kerry in contested states. And, and note the very limited goal, shake the society uh, in the quest for reforms in a more democratic culture. Nothing about what needs to be the real goal the overthrow of U.S. capitalism, imperialism. Isn't that what a, a real radical, a revolutionary is for? Nearly eight years later, Chomsky's good friend and fellow philosophical anarchist, though I always felt a little more open to and responsive to actual Marxists as opposed to anarchists, Howard Zinn, uh, um, nearly eight years later, uh, Chomsky's very good friend and um, fellow anarchist, Howard Zinn, wrote a critique of what he considered the quadrennial election madness. Election madness was the title of his essay in The Progressive, and uh, I think it was April of 2004. Here's Zinn. Would I support one candidate against another? Yes, for two minutes. The amount of time it takes to pull the lever down in the voting booth. But before and after those two minutes, Zinn wrote, our time, our energy should be spent building painstakingly a movement Then, when it reaches a certain critical mass would shake whoever is in the White House, in Congress, into changing national policy on matters of war and social justice. Again, note the absence of any revolutionary objective. This essay was basically a call for a kinder, gentler capitalism, imperialism uh, to be brought into being by mass pressure from below, kind of a grassroots speak truth to power movement, in essence. Changes in policy not changes in the underlying system, certainly not the mode of production, was a call for social grassroots movements, labor movements, women's movements, environmental movements, to bring about new and better conduct by the masters, not the radical reconstruction of society itself that Dr. Martin Luther King identified as the real issue to be faced beyond superficial matters, to use King's language in 1968. Okay, street. So who has proposed an alternative? Well, actually, Bob Avakian has. Uh, I'm going to put in the uh, notes associated with this audio a link to Avakian's draft proposal for a constitution for a new socialist republic in North America. If you want a good sense uh, of how a DSR, a desirable socialist revolution, would organize itself and on what principles embodied in what legal form, this is a very important document to be consulted and to be to consult and to take seriously and not to snark at and call totalitarian. Uh, I don't have time to go into all its details here. You've got to read it, of course, but please do that. One key difference between this draft constitution and all the various calls that I hear from progressives for a new U.S. constitutional convention, and a bunch of correspondents who are all into that, uh, is that Avakian's draft, and I think properly, is premised on the prior and necessary occurrence of a socialist revolution. Not just like holding up a draft constitution as here, here's your new order, bingo, bango. No. First, you'd have to have a revolution, and then this would be a, just a draft uh, proposal for what the new desirable socialist revolutionary government could look like and should look like. Um, and that's a lot of different, from, that's very different from what I hear from a lot of my uh, constitutional pals who seem to think 
uh, that the Constitutional Convention they want is the revolution itself. And some of them like to say peaceful, too, because they get all freaked out by the word revolution, which inherently brings up violence, as if revolutionaries are about making more bloodshed. That's what we're just bloodthirsty. We want a big terror. Uh, they don't seem to understand a lot of noble things uh, that some of them want in a new constitution would require a pr prior seizure of power by the masses under the leadership of a dedicated vanguard party determined to replace the profits system with revolutionary socialism. Another difference between a Vakian's draft constitution and the constitutional ideas I get from left friends is that my friends constitutional aims and ideological standpoint, uh, the standpoint behind their agendas are all about democracy, democracy, democracy. Uh, and this, I think, reflects a broader fetish um, for the long normative Western bourgeois forms and ideals of democracy. Uh, a Vakian and revolutionary communist, and I'm wearing a revolutionary communist button here, uh, have a different orientation more radical orientation. They refuse to discuss, not anti-democratic, so don't get me wrong, but they refuse to discuss in advanced democracy as a reified thing, and an, an ideal in and of itself outside of any solid rooting in the forces and relations of production and the basic historical material relations of society and the class power. <coughs> oh, you may hear my dog bark now. And some of you uh, people who are very concerned about Oreo should know. She has been taken out. There's some dogs outside. Oreo, please, I'm talking about revolutionary communism. We've talked about this. There's some dogs barking out there. It's driving me crazy. Um, progressives and anarchists, uh, I know, get their underwear twisted up over revolutionary communists having the chutzpah. I'm one of them. To say, no, the revolution we seek is not primarily about democracy. So... If they can get off their shock long enough to listen to the explanation for this, uh, I try to give them the following four reasons for this, why it's not just or primarily all about democracy. Reason number one, you cannot have a real actual democracy in a class stratified society. Democracy, technically speaking, means equal power and influence over government and society for all people, no matter who they are. Class division means disproportionate power and indeed rule over government and society by the folks atop the class pyramid. That's why many Marxists rightly describe the form of democracy that exists under capitalism. Um, they, they rightly describe the sort of democracy that exists under capitalism um, as bourgeois democracy, a cloak for the underlying class dictatorship of capital. Uh, and democracy under that de facto underlying dictatorship rooted in private ownership of, of core economic institutions. Um, democracy under that dictatorship can never be allowed to challenge the core prerogatives um, and outcomes of bourgeois ownership and, and bourgeois command of state and society. Bear in mind that many of the lefties who go on and on about democracy are propagating forms and ideals taken from bourgeois democracy and um, not out of any sense of what democracy would look like, which would be rather different and actually better in a socialist society. So that's, that's reason number one. Reason number two, the desirable socialist revolution does not end class inequality and class rule. Um, and it advances its own different measures and forms of democracy under socialism, under the candidly labeled dictatorship of the proletariat. It works to reduce class inequality. It works to reduce the class inequality that negates democracy under capitalism. But democracy is not at all its primary aim. Its primary goal is to replace capitalism with socialism and to, to thereby create a very different context within which popular culture, uh, mass politics, science, art, literature, relationships, love, music, everything 
can develop, including democracy, on the path to communism. But let's be clear, the DSR calls itself the dictatorship of the proletariat, and it means that. Its communist leadership understands that class and other oppression structures and ideas and habits and cultures associated with oppression do not just auto-magically disappear because a socialist revolution has occurred. It knows that many of those backwards and reactionary ideas and habits can and will continue to find considerable popular and sometimes even majority support. The communist leadership of a DSR seizes and uses state power to find majority support. Excuse me, seizes and uses state power to defeat counter-revolutionary forces both inside and outside the country in which it has seized power. It does not assume that the majority is always right about everything at all. It will not return society to capitalism, even if majority opinion can occasionally be shown to favor such an absolutely disastrous step. And it has, yes, the unmitigated, supposedly authoritarian chutzpah to think that it has a legitimate and principled and scientific claim to significantly direct society and inspire masses on the road to a world where no part of humanity any longer exploits another part of humanity. And where the guiding principle is from each according to their abilities and to each according to their needs. Now, the fourth reason we don't go off about democracy and make that the, the primary thing is that democracy actually ceases to be an issue under communism. And that may sound shocking, but I mean it. To quote Joe Biden, no joke. Think about it. Seriously, why does the constant demand for democracy exist in the first place? Because of class rule and, and because of other forms of oppressive and parasitic and exploitive inequality and rule expressed in the wildly disproportionate control even rule over state and society by ruling classes and, and ruling groups. When exploitation and oppression of one part of the species by another part of the species has become a thing of history books and museums, when that exploitation and oppression, and indeed even the desire of some to rule over and exploit and oppress others has become a thing of the past, when all that happens, government is reduced to the rational agreed upon regulation of humanity's relationship to nature and to the process of supervising abundance for all. And this outcome is of course completely impossible and utopian when viewed through the lens of standard bourgeois notions of human nature as you know, inherently competitive and inherently selfish and inherently dominance oriented. Those notions are completely without scientific basis. But of course, those notions have always been a very nice and convenient match for bourgeois class rule and for capitalism and for the society of, of the rat race and how do we get over on each other. Perfect match for that. And those ideas of human nature uh, are hardly accidentally pervasive and prevalent across the ideological superstructure of the capitalist world under the 500 year so far rule of capital. Uh, and that brings me to a final thing that I'll probably have to open up with next time uh, because I'm seeing I'm at 24 minutes right now. I'd rather, I'd rather instead of going over 25, I'd rather open with this next time. But that brings me to a final thing that gets a lot of lefties, uh, undies all up in a bunch and snarky and angry and you can see the blood rising in their faces. And, and that's when I say this, the goal of the desirable socialist revolution is not, it's not only not democracy, it's also not actually equality. It's not equality. It's not the primary goal. This will shock some of you listening because the demand for equality is pervasive in the declarations of, numer of, of bourgeois politics and also socialist politics over the many years. 
Uh, one of the United States um, avowedly Marxist parties actually calls itself the Socialist Equality Party. And uh, don't get me wrong, just as there will be considerably more democracy and better democracy under the DSR than there ever could be under capitalism, there will also be considerably more equality under the class rule of the proletariat than under the class rule uh, of the bourgeoisie. But the goal of the DSR is communism. And communism isn't really about equality. Please don't freak out. I, I, I will pick up on this. And I will explain more at the beginning of my next video, which will go up tomorrow. On that note, I bid you all adieu.